Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Still waiting for Victoria to sit down. <laughs> it takes forever to figure out how she wants to sit down. That's my miniature schnauzer. Um, today I want to talk about 120 or 2 and we've kind of talked about this in the past but there's so much to, uh, if you want to turn to Acts chapter 1, there's so much to this chapter that we don't realize. So it's almost like an expository study, but I don't hit, I'm not hitting everything. Okay, I'm just hitting certain things because I want to make a point, okay? 120 or 2. And as we go through this study, brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, think about this. In our life as a Christian, as we go through this study, in our life as a Christian, it can be summed up in two parts. Okay? The most simplest things. When you get saved, what's your life about? Keeping the commandments of God. Okay? There are commands in the King James Bible for English, for God's perfect written word for English speaking people. There are commands in here that we spend our whole lifetimes trying to learn and trying to obey and live. You know how I'm always preaching that you're supposed to live this book. One of the commands God gives, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. It's a command. Okay, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Our life of sanctification is based off the commands of God. Okay? So when you get saved, you become a new creature in Christ Jesus and you start living for the Lord and the Lord starts telling you what to do. He gives you the do's and the don'ts. What you're supposed to be doing, what you're not supposed to be doing. Okay, the command about being part of the ministry of reconciliation. These are commands. Okay? So as a Christian, the first part of a Christian's life is we're doing our best to please God. And you please God by keeping His commands. What's the second part of a Christian's life? If you want to sum it up, it's waiting on the Lord. Being patient and waiting on the Lord. Whether it's present tense in the life we're living here, or we're waiting on the Lord because we're only two-thirds redeemed. Our soul and our spirit are redeemed, but our body, this filthy, wicked, sinful body you see right here, is not redeemed. We're waiting for the catching away of the body of Christ. We're waiting to see what God's going to do in the world. But even in our own personal lives, our personal walks with the Lord, we're waiting on the Lord. And that's what this part of the study is really going to be pushing, is being patient and waiting on the Lord. Uh, pray about things. Study things. Okay? and make sure it's what God wants. Today we see so many people pushing the envelope, as, you, as they say, and trying to force God into something and then make it well, where it's godly, therefore it's okay. But bottom line, it's what they want. Not necessarily sinful or wicked, but it's what they want. It's not always necessarily what God wants. You gotta wait on the Lord. But there's a lot of other interesting God, things God showed me in, the cha in the, Acts chapter one. Okay, so if you want to turn to Acts chapter 1, um, please have your King James Bibles open. Always pause the video. When I do Bible study, watch Bible studies, the other brethren do, I'm always pausing it, turning, pausing it, turning. And when you're trying to do videos like this outside with the wind, um, and trying to do this with the notes, I try to do a lot of scripture. So, in doing lots of scripture, I try to read my notes. And I had someone give me a hard time. Let's get over to Acts chapter 1. I had someone give me a hard time saying, you're not turning open the Bible and actually turning everywhere that you're talking about. Well, I'm trying to keep these studies short because when you pause and turn and then unpause and pause and turn and unpause, any video Bible study I watch that's an hour long, to me, it ends up taking an hour and a half because I do pause and turn. There's times where I'll pause the video and start reading something or start talking to the Lord about something in the study that I'm listening to. Or God might give me, an, give you or give me an, uh, another memory verse that we remember and we want to talk about it or we want to quickly get over to it and then get back to the study. But more than anything, just the pausing and going, if it's a good Bible study grounded in the Word, there's going to be a lot of pausing, turning, pausing, turning, and then replaying. Okay? So don't let the fact that I'm reading from a clipboard, the Word of God, because I have the scriptures here too, don't let that get in the way of you learning. Okay? Don't let that get in the way of you having your Bible open. Okay? Don't let something this little become something to argue and complain about. 
and it gets in the way of you learning and applying God's word in your heart and to your life. That's what it means by well, that's what I mean by applying it to your heart. It means you're applying it to your life. She's doing this circling again, trying to decide what, how she wants to sit. You can't see her in the video, maybe, but she's still here. And if I don't set her beside me, her walking, <laughs> her walking along the deck makes a lot of noise, and the camera picks up this new camera that the brethren helped me get. Really picks up a lot of the noise, and it also muffles the wind. So I'm hoping it works for the wind, and we don't have to redo this inside. Let's get to the study. I, I named it 120 or 2, and you're going to find out why when we get to it. But as I was going through here, I was like, we might as well do a little bit more of an expository study and talk about a few things that I think are very important. When we get through this, you're going to find out why it's so important to understand that this is a great example of why Acts is a transition book. Okay? And how this applies a lot to what they're doing here, uh, what Peter's doing here, and Acts 1 is what we see in organized religion, is what we see going on in our go in, in America, and the governmental system and everything. It's not Holy Spirit led. I'm getting ahead of myself. So Acts chapter 1. The former, the former trees have I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. I had this underlined because it's very important for the study. Okay? Given commandments. God gives commands. Okay? And we're to follow them. We're not to twist them. We're not to change them. We're not to ignore them. We don't get to pick and choose things that we want to. But God gives commands. So that's a key point here. The other key point is to the apostles whom he has chosen. To the apostles whom Jesus had chosen. God has chosen. Okay? Uh, verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days. See, one of the things is, before I got saved, I didn't know much. I thought I knew a lot about, you know, Christianity and the Bible and realized I didn't know nothing. <laughs> I really didn't know nothing. Jesus was raised from the dead, showed himself to his, to his disciples, and went straight up to heaven. Uh, no, he stuck around for a little bit. Okay? Seen of them forty days, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God, spiritual kingdom, and talking as we get down through here, because they'll ask him a question, and I have to believe he's talking about he talked to him about the kingdom of of heaven. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Talking about the physical kingdom in Israel, where Jesus is going to rule and reign for a thousand years, what we call the millennial kingdom, but just a thousand year reign of Jesus Christ as king, fulfilling prophecy that hasn't been fulfilled yet. But Jesus is there preaching and teaching to him for 40 days. Now, if you turn to Matthew, hold your hands there, because we're going to go through the whole chapter of Acts, chapter 1. But if you want to turn to Matthew 10, 2, we go through the list of the apostles, because it says apostles there. You understand, There's, I'm going to show examples where an apostle can be a disciple, it's interchangeable. But not all disciples are apostles. I hope you can understand that. There's, there's 12 apostles when Jesus was walking. He chose 12 people to be apostles. But at one time they were called disciples. And they can still be called disciples today as an apostle. Okay, Peter was a disciple, but he's also an apostle. Paul's a dis uh, disciple, but he's also an apostle. John and everything. They're interchangeable with people who have been chosen as apostles. They can also be referred to in the Bible as disciples, which we're going to find out here in some of the scriptures. But there were disciples back then that weren't apostles. Not all disciples are apostles. Seems a little confusing, but we're going to get through the scriptures, and hopefully it, through the scriptures and the Holy Spirit, you understand what I'm saying. Matthew chapter 10, verse 2. Now the names of the tw twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus, and Lebaeus, 
whose surname was Thaddeus. Verse 4, Simon and the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot who also betrayed him. Remember, there's two Judas Iscariots, but only one Judas Iscariot was an apostle. But there was also another Judas Iscariot you'll read in the Bible that says, but not the one who betrayed him. He was a, he was a disciple of Jesus Christ, but he wasn't an apostle. Okay. And there's also other names, other names of James, like the brother of, of Jesus. So I went through here just for an uh, argument. Let's go through. These people are apostles. Well, how did they become apostles? First, who called them to follow Jesus Christ? Some of them just saw some of the, uh, I believe some of them probably saw some of the uh, healing and listened to some of the preaching of Jesus and started following. You had disciples of John the Baptist went to follow Jesus and asked him, where dwellest thou? And he talks about birds of the air and everything. And at the end, he's like, come and see. They, they heard his preaching. They heard John talk about him saying, this is the Christ. That's how they followed Jesus. And they started following Jesus. But some of them were actually called by Jesus, follow me, specifically. Okay. Uh, so let's go through some of those. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. Turn back to Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the seaside, I'm sorry, by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me. Would we read up there? Given uh, in Acts chapter 1, verse 2, where it said, Had given commandment unto the apostles whom he had chosen. He called Ma uh, Peter. Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting the nets. He said, Follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Okay? Jesus called them. We go to Matthew chapter 4, jump down a few verses to 21. It says, And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee, Zebedee, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them, and immediately they left the ship and their father and followed him. Jesus verbally called them. Okay. John 1, John chapter 1, verse 43, we read, The day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew, and Peter. But there's another person, uh, one of the apostles, where Jesus said, Follow me. But at the time, it's... A, it's it's dis, uh, disciples. I want to use the right words. We're going to get to the point where why he chose that God, Jesus, chose these people to be apostles, to have a different, have a new title that goes along with being a disciple, but distinction from the rest of the people that were following. Mm -hmm. Now Bartholomew, I only found mention of him of the <laughs> of the twelve when it talks about the twelve. But there's a verse we're going to get to where it talks about how Jesus chose and goes through and names all these people again. The twelve apostles. How they, why are they apostles? Because Jesus chose these people. Okay. Now if I miss something, I, I, I was trying to look for some of this stuff, but I wanted to get to the rest of the study. So if I missed something and there was actually something talking about Bartholomew other than the two mentioning, because I typed in the name, couldn't find it, please show it in the, in the chat. Okay. But you had Bartholomew, couldn't find much. You can't find a lot on a lot of the on all the apostles. Okay, Thomas. All I, one thing I found about Thomas, he turned to John chapter 20, verse 24. You have Thomas, which is one of the twelve apostles. We read it up there. And it says, John 20, 24, it says, This is after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, where he's shown himself off and on to certain people and some of the apostles, but not all of them. Thomas, he didn't get to see. Let's look at Thomas' reaction. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Digimus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hands into his side, I will not believe. Jews require a sign. Greeks seek after wisdom. 
And as we see when we get the axe and keep going, they're still looking for signs when they cast lots. Getting ahead of myself. I will not believe. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the door being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Now stop there. Jesus wasn't even there, but he heard what Thomas said. Today, brothers and sisters in Christ, the Holy Spirit is with you, and I keep pushing this with the brethren. Don't ever think that there's one moment that Jesus isn't there. Now normally that's a comfort. We'd use that to comfort people, but I'm using that as a warning. You start slipping and falling back into old habits. The old man tries to resurrect himself. You start giving in to sin and temptation. Jesus is there. You say things. Jesus heard what you said. There's, there's no hiding from Jesus Christ. The lost world, it's going to be the same way with the lost world at the great white throne judgment. There's no hiding anything they did or said from Jesus Christ. Be very careful. Verse 20, And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God, because he saw. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet believe. So there we hear the story about Thomas, his doubting. He wants physical proof, and he's given it, and Jesus even throws it in his face. But blessed are those who haven't seen. You just lost a blessing, because you wanted a sign and couldn't believe what Jesus told him before his death, burial, and resurrection. But we hear about Thomas there. Uh, turn to Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of customs, and said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. So we see Matthew, Jesus called him out, Follow me. Okay. Uh, uh, James, the son of Alphaeus, James, the, uh, you know, I got put on the James, the son of Mary, question mark. This is the James. I get them mixed up sometimes. But James, the son of Alphaeus, I couldn't find much on him. Thaddeus, same thing. Simon the Canaanite. Okay. Uh, we always ask, I've always asked this. Why don't, and this is something I'll ask God someday when face to face, and he will reveal things to us as like, what happened to the, all the apostles? You know, you don't hear a lot about all 12 apostles after uh, the death, burial, resurrection, the 40 days, and Jesus rises up. We're going to read as we keep going down. It, it names some of the, the people that are with him. A lot of them are the apostles that are with him up in that room before Pentecost. Okay. But we don't hear much about a lot of them after that. Okay. Uh, Judas Iscariot. You hear a lot about Judas Iscariot. Why? Because he betrayed Jesus Christ. Turn to Luke 23, 3 if you wish. There's a lot of things we're going to skip. Uh, we're going to jump around from verses just to show where the Bible mentions him, what kind of person he is, and okay. Luke 22:3 says, "Then Satan entered, then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. He was numbered with the twelve, but who numbered him with the twelve? That's the key to getting back to our study on Acts. Who numbered him among the twelve? Jesus Christ did." Uh, Matthew 26, 14, and Satan entered him. And we're going to read, I've, God showed me something pretty amazing, that, you know, you realize that Judas wasn't Satan's first choice? Judas was not the first man that, got, that Satan wanted to betray Jesus. It wasn't his first choice. We'll find out who Satan's first choice is as we go through the study. And we might make, I might do a whole other study on it, just to expound a little bit more. But Matthew 26, 14, then one of the twelve one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest. Right? I don't have to keep going, because mainly we're just talking about he was one of the twelve. John 12, 1 says, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment, a spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, he's also an apostle, 
they're interchangeable. Calls up uh, Judas Iscariot. But up before it says one of the twelve. Okay. Now he's a disciple. It's like interchangeable. Just let people know that. Okay. Just because it calls him a disciple here doesn't mean he wasn't one of the twelve. He wasn't an apostle. So then one of the, his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. He coveted money, riches, lust. You know? Satan, I'm getting ahead of myself, but Satan, he'll find your flaws, brothers and sisters in Christ. He'll find your addictions, um, the sins that you struggle with, and he'll try to use that to sift you as wheat. Now, if anybody knows their Bible, they know where that comes from, sifting as wheat. But he, he's trying to use that to get you to destroy your walk with the Lord, to get you to portray Jesus Christ. Be careful. He used Judas Iscariot because he was the last choice, I guess. I, I can't say that to be 100%, you know, this is absolute truth, but Judas Iscariot wasn't Satan's first choice. Okay. Because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. He started having authority over the money. And he started getting greedy. And it's something I believe built over time. When Jesus first called uh, Judas Iscariot, he wasn't the man he was at the very end. At some point, something happened where he just gave in to sin and decided to turn his back on Jesus. And then Jesus started saying, one of you will betray me future tense. But then as he goes along, there comes a point where he says, one of you is a devil. So there was a change at some point where Judas had gone too far. And as we read in this, it's going to say Judas Iscariot was part, had part in the ministry. In the old, because Jesus was in the Old Testament, you know, and the New. <laughs> but before he died, it was the Old Testament. And remember, the gospel back then was repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They're to repent and be baptized and be ready for Jesus to rule and reign as king for a thousand years. That was the gospel when Jesus was, was John the Baptist preached it, then Jesus preached it in the Old Testament. Verse 7, Then said Jesus, Let her alone. Against the day of my bearing hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Okay? He's very, Judas Iscariot was very money oriented. And you can go through a whole other study on Judas Iscariot and the betraying of Jesus Christ, and we can get to a whole other study on it. But I just wanted to point out Judas was one that was chosen, and at some point he went bad. At some point, the flesh just took over, and he opened the door for Satan to come in and sift him as wheat. And we'll get to where I get that statement sifting as wheat. Okay? But we can always end it with this, everything, even though we couldn't get all the apostles, like stories on the apostles, where they came from and everything. Luke chapter 6 verse 13 pretty much flat out says it, even so is the very first verse that we read that listed them all. But it's one thing to say these are the apostles, but why are these the apostles? Okay. Luke chapter 6 verse 13. Hopefully, like I said, I hope the wind isn't messing with the mic. <laughs> This is supposed to be this is a really good mic. Luke 6, 13. And when it was day, he called unto him, called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve. Out of all his disciples, he chose twelve of them, whom also he named apostles. Also means together. So they can hold the title disciple, and they can hold the title apostle. Okay? But it says here, just flat out, of whom he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. Let me go through them again. Chapter 14, Simon, who he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the, and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which also was a traitor. 
So here it is again, the Judas, the brother of James. You can go through the names again, but the point of this is he chose the twelve. Jesus did. Let's get back to Acts. Just really had to drive that home, and it's fun going through the scriptures, really driving that home. He's the one that chose. Go back to Acts chapter 1, verse 4 in your King James Bibles. And being assembled together with them, commanded, this is another command, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promises of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. You want to know why there's so many false converts out there that hate the real Jesus Christ of Scripture? And they hate us Bible believers, true Bible believers? Right there, what we talked about. The true life of a Christian is you give your life to Christ. You're not your own. You are bought with a price. He commands, you obey. That's the first thing they hate. They want to be able to command their own lives. All these false professing Christians out there, especially the false professing Bible believers out there that attack the true gospel of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. They hate it. Why? Because that means when they get saved, they have to give their lives to somebody, Jesus Christ, and that person, Jesus Christ, who's the person of the Godhead, is now in authority over them. He tells them what to do, and they have to do it. And if they don't, they're failing Him. They're in sin. There's consequences. The ultimate consequences of sin is paid when you get saved. You don't lose your salvation for sinning against God as a saved sinner. But there's still consequences in this life. You still have to answer for it at the judgment seat of Christ. Your life as a Christian, the good works and the bad works, they hate that. They hate having to be held accountable and having someone rule over them. They hate it. And the second thing they hate is waiting. They hate it. They're so impatient, they just hate it. They can't wait. They want, they want what they want, and they want it now. And brothers and sisters in Christ, there's times where we fail the Lord and start having the same attitude. We need to be patient, and we need to wait sometimes. Okay? Here, you got the command that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. Wait for it. What's the promise of the Father? The Holy Spirit. You don't have to turn here, but John 14, 26, the whole chapter of John, not the whole chapter, but a big portion of chapter of John, uh, John chapter 14, talks about the Comforter. It says, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. He shall teach you all things. They were to wait. That's the command. Wait for the promise. And then He shall teach you all things. He will teach them what they're supposed to do. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I had said unto you. So when Jesus ascends up, they are to wait. And Now they don't know the exact day of Pentecost, but they are to wait until Pentecost happens and they receive the Holy Ghost and become converted. They're not converted yet. That's something to let it sink in. You're reading the books of Acts and you think, well, you have Peter here and you have these people, they're all saved Christians. Not yet. They haven't been converted yet. They don't have the Holy Spirit yet. Okay. And bring all things around us whatsoever I said unto you. John 15, 26 we read, But when the Comforter is come, who I will send you, send unto you from the Father... Remember what we just read up there, it said, promise of the Father, it talks about the Holy Ghost. Jesus said this way before he died, death, burial, and resurrection. Okay. But when the Comforter has come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from my Father, he shall testify of me. We read in John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. He got caught up and then told him to wait. Before he got caught up, I told him to wait. 
that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. I will send him unto you. Yeah. Okay. They were to wait. They were given the command to wait. Back in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, okay, they've been given the command. Wait till you receive the Holy Spirit. Before. Now, I'm not trying to add to it because he said wait in Jerusalem to receive the Holy Spirit. And then we remember what Jesus told them before. The Holy Spirit will guide you in all truth. The Holy Spirit is what's going to tell them what they need to do next. When we get saved as a saved sinner, you, you can know right from wrong from to a point, but having that conviction, when you're reading the Scriptures, and the Scripture says, abstain from all appearance of evil, that conviction by the Holy Spirit, it's important. We need it. Without the Holy Spirit, it just becomes a feeling or opinion. Well, maybe it's wrong, or maybe it's not wrong, or maybe it's okay, maybe it's not okay. But the Holy Spirit's what convicts us and says, hey, what you're doing there is wrong. And you can be stubborn, you can be prideful and try to hold on to that wrong and that sin. But for the most part, the Holy Spirit's there is going to keep hammering you until you get rid of that sin. It's going to be convicting you. Bible talks about, we've talked about, where you can quench the Holy Spirit to the point where I don't want to hear you. And you can mess up your life as a Christian so bad that God will kill you and bring you home early and you'll miss out on rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Because you've totally just, just made a mess of your life as a Christian. That's not the desire of your heart, though, of a Christian. Has it happened before? I believe it has. I've seen people that I believe are saved that's just made a mess of their life. I've seen people that are saved that they're heading in that direction because they've got sin in their life they refuse to let go of. I've seen brethren that fall away and then come back. Fall away, come back. It's a constant struggle. But it's the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 verse 6. And the point that I'm making here is they don't have the Holy Spirit yet. I'm going to get ahead of myself a little bit. Peter's going to stand up and start making decrees, holy decrees. I'm, I'm not trying to add to scripture, but he's coming out and trying to make it all religious and, and, and formal and, and, and everything without the Holy Spirit. He doesn't have the Holy Spirit. He didn't wait like the Lord said. He didn't obey God's command saying, hey, wait. Stay here and wait. He didn't wait. Acts chapter 1 verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? So now they're talking about the kingdom of heaven. Remember, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by forth. That's a physical kingdom. People have been fighting over Jerusalem since, for the longest time, even before Jesus was born. They're fighting over Jerusalem. Okay. But they've been fighting over Jerusalem since Jesus was ascended up, and we're still waiting for Very strong breeze. The clouds are going by really fast. But they're asking about the physical kingdom, not the spiritual kingdom, the physical kingdom. Verse 7, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons, for the Father hath put it in his own power. But ye shall receive power right now, so you can start making decisions and start doing things. And claiming it's what God wants? No. You receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Witnesses. The ministry of reconciliation. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Not before. That's why it's just so painful to watch a lot of false converts out there. Oh, I'm witnessing for Jesus Christ, but they're not witnessing for the Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. They don't have the Holy Spirit in them. They've never repented. They hate repentance. Repentance starts at salvation and continues the rest of your walk with the Lord in this life before the catching away of the body of Christ and before you die and go home and be with the Lord. Repentance is a big part of your life. And if you hate it at salvation and try to take it out of salvation, then you're going to hate it in your life as a Christian, as a false Christian, a professing Christian. You're going to hate it, period. Okay. 
You need the Holy Spirit in you before you witness. You need to be saved before you witness. I mean, for some of us, brothers and sisters Christ, we're like a duh thing, but I'm just saying it. That's what Jesus is saying here. After the Holy Ghost comes, then you go out and witness. Then that power will come upon you. Everything we read about the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, will guide you into all truth. Then that will happen once you have the Holy Spirit, not before. Verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. Now we've talked about this before, just a side note. I believe this is how we're going to go up, catching away the body of Christ. Some people, they always keep trying to teach that it's, people are just going to vanish. And then they start saying, clothes might be left behind. Blood might be left behind. I don't believe any of that. How did Jesus go up? Okay. And we did a teaching on it. I've already had a little side study on it. You know, we talk about the, all of the men that were caught up in the Bible. Enoch and um, Elijah. And then we talk about Jesus. And every time, I mean, Enoch doesn't really talk about it, but Elijah, you could see him go up. Someone saw him go up. He didn't leave clothes behind. He didn't leave blood behind. He went up. When Jesus went up, he did not leave blood behind. He didn't leave clothes behind. I understand he was in his resurrected body, his incorruptible body, I believe. But he still didn't leave that stuff behind. And look how he went up. He went up without it. It wasn't instant. People just disappear. I believe what little Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women are still left at the catching away of the body of Christ, it's going to be a, an event that people are going to see and notice. It's not going to be something that are hidden. Why is that? Because in the book of Revelation, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, a lot of people get saved in the time of Jacob's trouble. Why? Because a huge event, the catching away of the body of Christ, happened and people saw it. Those people were right. Those people were telling the truth. They were the real Christians. We were the fakes. And then they truly get saved. Take my other sight. And while they were looking steadfast towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you in heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So when you read Revelation, he comes down on a white horse with clouds. But he comes down on a cloud. Just as he went up in a cloud. Verse 12. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they were come in, they went into an upper room where abode both Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. Okay. Verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Um, so as you can see, they're all there. There's a group of people there. Not just the apostles, but there's a group of people there. And we're going to see the numbering of the people as we go along. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that when we get there, there's not going to be 120 people in that room. It said who was all in that room. But we get to Acts chapter 1, verse 15. We're on 15. It says, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of the names together were about 120. So Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples in those days. 120 disciples. Okay. Now, does this... It says that Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Remember, the apostles can be called disciples. So if this included the 11 apostles that are sitting there, then it includes them. If it doesn't, then you, know, you can add 12 to that. But the bottom line is there's a group of people there, a good group of people there. Now Luke chapter 22, you don't have to turn here, but chapter 22, verse 7. Actually, we're going to turn there. There's so much, I didn't put it in my notes. So Luke chapter 22, verse 7. Oops, going too fast. Luke 22, verse 7. Luke 
Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover, that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entered in. And he shall say unto the goodman of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber? Well, I shall eat the Passover with my disciples. He said disciples, but he's talking about his apostles. But they can also be called disciples. And he shall show you a large upper room furnished, there make, there make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. So he said, my disciples, and then he calls them apostles. I just wanted to read some more verses showing how they're inexchangeable. Apostles, an apostle can be a disciple. They're interchangeable. You can call them a disciple or you can call them an apostle. But not all disciples are apostles. Okay? There's 120 people there. They're disciples. But only 11 of them are apostles. The question that I threw on here just for are you for me to help me with my walk with the Lord is are you a disciple of, of Jesus Christ? A true disciple of Jesus Christ obeys his commands, listens to him, heeds the words he says. Are you truly a disciple of Jesus Christ? Are you doing your best to obey, to study this book and obey the commands of God? To live a life of Christ. But you have disciples, you have apostles. Apostles can be called disciples, but not every disciple can be called an apostle. Only 11 of them could. 12, Judas Iscariot, but he fell. But at this point, there's 11. Uh, Luke chapter 22, verse, uh, go jump down to verse 31. We're already there, jump down to verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Here's where we're getting into it. Like I said, I could do a whole other study on this someday, and I pray that the Lord puts it on my heart too, but it's very important. It says here, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you. Let that sink in. Satan desired to have Peter? That was his first choice to betray Jesus? Hmm. Now, like I said, I'm not trying to add to scripture. I'm not saying this is 100% Satan wanted Peter and nobody else. I'm just saying Jesus himself said Satan desired to have thee and he singles out Peter. He didn't say John. He didn't say all the others. Although Satan probably desired to mess them up too. He desired to mess anything that God has. He hates Jesus. I understand that. But he goes out of his way to say you Peter. Okay. The Lord said Simon, Simon, and Peter Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Satan. Verse 32, But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Peter, right now we're going to get ahead. Peter standing up in, the, in Acts 1 to strengthen the brethren. But notice here, Jesus gave him said and when thou art converted strengthen thy brethren Peter isn't converted yet he doesn't have the Holy Spirit yet he didn't obey God's command to wait but here God's talking to him saying when thou art converted strengthen thy brethren verse 33 and he said unto him Lord I'm ready to go with thee both into prison and to death See, Peter's like gung-ho for the Lord. I'm ready to do all this. And then, then God says, and he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou hast thrice denied that thou knowest me. Peter had this thing about jumping the gun, jumping the gun, and not waiting on Jesus. Here he is jumping up. I'm willing to die for you. And he says, you're going to deny me three times. We did a story about <laughs> who cut off the ear, you know. 
It's like Jesus, uh, Peter jumps the gun again. <laughs> just sliced that ear off. And Jesus goes, no, this isn't what I wanted. Why don't you ask me what I wanted? This isn't what I wanted. Puts, takes the ear, heals the man. Puts the ear back on the, eye, the man. Peter's always gung-ho. and there's, It's good to want to be on fire for the Lord and to do things for the Lord. But you need to make sure it's what the Lord wants. Okay? You need to make sure that you're waiting on the Lord and the Lord's confirming, yeah, that's what I want for you. There's a lot of different types of ministries out there and sometimes you can get into a ministry that God doesn't want. Sometimes your ministry is doing just fine and you start steering off into other places where God doesn't want you to go. And it starts hurting the ministry that you have. you got to be patient. Peter was just really gung-ho for the Lord and that's... a. I'm not trying to doubt it, but sometimes you can jump the gun when you get too overzealous and you don't wait. He was told to wait until he was converted to strengthen the brethren. And here he is trying to strengthen the brethren without being converted as we keep going. Acts chapter 1 verse 16. Turn back to Acts chapter 1 verse 16. This is him. He's going to try to strengthen the brethren without being converted. And what happens? Acts chapter 1 verse 16 Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guided to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Like I said, I believe one time Judas is scary because it's Old Testament People, oh, Jesus Iscariot was never saved. Uh, by what gospel? It's not the, the gospel that Jesus was preaching, that John the Baptist was preaching at the beginning of his ministry isn't the same gospel that we preach today. Mm -hmm. It's still Old Testament. You can lose it. <laughs> I believe Judas Iscariot lost it. Okay. Um, tame part of the, this ministry, verse 18. And the part was the Old Testament. But like I said, this is a good example of a transition period. You're transitioning from the Old Testament to the New Testament. He lost the new, the, a part of the ministry for the New Testament. He lost it. Verse 18. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst. And all his bowels gushed out. Verse 19. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as the field is called in their proper tongue, uh, a keldama, that is to say, the field of blood. I probably just butchered that name. But field of blood. Verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let, us, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishop, bishop, prick, let another take. Let another take. So they read that, another take, so there's supposed to be a twelfth one. There's supposed to be a twelfth apostle, so we're going to pick him. He jumps the gun. But real quick, some people say it's a contradiction in the death of, of what the Bible says when it comes to Judas Iscariot and how he died. Let's go to the, what they call the contradiction. Matthew chapter 27, verse 1. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. Worldly sorrow. Remember what Jesus said. Woe to that man. Once you've betrayed them, you're condemned. It's Old Testament. There is no forgiveness. Once you've, he did that, he was condemned. There is no forgiveness. But he repented, but he had worldly sorrow. Mm -hmm. Verse 4, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. They said, Well, how is that the same thing? Well, instead of doubting the Bible, because a lot of people will doubt the Bible and try to change the Bible, like the Bible perversions, they can't live with, put up with what God says. 
That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. When you start having faith in God's Word and say, okay, let's try to figure this out. Lord, I don't get it. Show me. I don't understand, Lord. Can you show me? God will open your eyes and show you things. Okay? Back then, if you're by yourself, the way to hang yourself in a tree isn't the way that, you know, people in groups would hang somebody in a tree. You had to find a tree with a limb that went over, no matter how, if it was just a slight slope or it was a hardcore hill so that you could throw the rope around and right now there's too much slack but you jump over the hillside where there's nothing underneath you and you hang yourself and what they're saying there in Acts is that when he did that his neck could have snapped killed him the limb could have broke it could have fallen down the hillside and as it started falling headlong he burst asunder in the mist and all his bowels gushed out it's not a contradiction. It's just you got to think, okay, Lord, I don't get it. Lord, I don't understand. Can you show it to me? Uh, ask some of the brethren, I don't get this. Okay? Don't be one of those people that always has, oh, there's a contradiction. Oh, there's another contradiction. All the contradictions that people, all the attacks on the King James Bible have been answered. Do I know all the attacks? Have all the attacks come to my attention? No, but there's some people that have vehemently defended the King James Bible as the God's perfect written word who have gone through every attack that's been on the King James Bible and they've answered them all. But it takes faith. It takes the Holy Spirit. God opening the truth to you and saying, okay, I don't get it, but Lord, I'm going to wait until you show me. Be patient. There goes it again. Be patient and wait. God will open your eyes and show you. There's things I come across in the Bible I don't understand. But God shows me later. There's things I've read a hundred times, and the one time I read it, I get something amazing out of it. Why didn't I get that the first time? Because I had to be patient. Mm -hmm. God knows what He's doing. Jesus Christ, who is God, fully and completely, knows what He's doing. Mm -hmm. Verse 5, And he cast down, or no, uh, verse 6, And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for lawful for to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. <laughs> I mean, they started getting pricked to their heart because they don't follow the law. They don't care about the law. They care about their law, but they don't care about the, God's law. Just their law. Maybe that's why they cared about it, because it's their law. Verse 7, And they took counsel and bought them and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. That's where we're getting the comparing Scripture with Scripture. Where is Peter getting this? He was there, but you can see, you go back to Matthew, oh, there it's mentioned again, twofold. Okay. But once again, don't doubt God's Word because you come across something that seems like a contradiction, but you don't get it. I've had brethren ask me that. Once they believe, then they don't believe. They feared God, then they didn't fear God. And we had to explain it. It's not a contradiction. You just have to wait on the Lord and don't be afraid to fellowship. That's what fellowship's for, to ask brethren, has God maybe shown you already? Could you kind of give me a, a starter, like hint on some scriptures to start my own study? You know, that kind of stuff. Okay. But remember what we talked about. Satan wanted Peter. But Satan chose and settled for Judas. That's what I believe. When you, when you read that study, you start realizing that Satan really wanted Peter. Now Peter ended up denying Jesus three times. But it's not the portrayal that Jesus was talking about when it came to Judas Iscariot. God, uh, Satan wanted Peter to betray Jesus. He really wanted to go after, I believe he wanted to go after Peter when you read that. Okay? Satan wants to go after Bible believers, people who are truly saved, Bible believing, God fearing men and women out there, brothers and sisters Christ. He's going to go after you and try to sift you like wheat. And how does he get in? You've got to open the door for him. He has no power and authority to come into this home unless I open the door for him. Some people say, well, God, God gives him permission. I understand that. But I'm saying in the day-to-day -day life of a Christian, that's why I always tell people, the wind's blowing again. <laughs> that's why I always keep telling people that you make sure that your home is a Bible-believing, God-fearing, abstain from all appearance of evil home. It's the only place that can be. 
In this evil and wicked world today, the moment you step outside and you start walking downtown, there's evil. There's wickedness. Women wearing men's apparel. Immodestly dressed women. Men with long hair. I mean, you go tattoos, uh, cussing, satanic style music, uh, say, uh, bad imagery, you know, posters, this, that, whatever. And you can just say, I'm just trying to go get some, <laughs> go to town just to get groceries and come back ASAP. It's that bad. Your home is the place that's supposed to be a Bible believing, God fearing home. And oftentimes, if you actually look at your walk with the Lord, oftentimes when Satan finds his way into your home, it's because you let him in. It's not that you had a perfectly abstained from all parents of evil home, and, and God just gave him permission, like they try to turn back to the story of Jonah and the whale. <laughs> uh, not Jonah. Um, Job. We'll start with the J. <laughs> Job. They try to go back to Job and look at that and say, yeah, I understand that. But today as a Christian, I can go back in my life and say, how many times has Satan come in and try to sift me as wheat and really mess up my walk with the Lord? It's when I let him. When I let sin back into my life. When I faltered. Okay? That's when Satan was able to come in and start trying to sift me like wheat. Now, we can't lose our salvation. Satan can't. Once you're truly saved and born again, you can't lose your salvation. But Satan can really mess you up as a Christian where he, God, God's just not pleased with you. You're missing out on rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. You become the best bad example instead of being a good example to the lost world and the body of Christ. He can really mess you up. So my advice to you, brothers and sisters in Christ, like I said, I can do a whole other study on it. I probably will, if the Lord willing. Uh, don't open that door, just real quick. Don't open the door to Satan and let him into your home. Continue to saint the sanctification. Remember, commands of God, pleasing God, commands of God, and waiting on Him. That's the life of a Christian. You go through your house. There were still times, years later, I found something wicked. I just found um, there was a cowboy thing that was a um, that was given to my daughter for her room that covers the window. My, my brain kind of freezes sometimes on the names. But it had a horse, and then this image, and then this horse, and then this image. And when I went back and looked at it, it's a pentagram, like a sheriff star, but it's a pentagram. And it starts bothering me because I got rid of a lot of things that look like pentagrams in my house. They're, they're evil, they're wicked. A star is not a pentagram, a real star. Uh, that's would be a whole other study on how to draw a star, but you don't draw it the way they do it. It's a pentagram. It's a satanic symbol. Okay. I'm still finding stuff to this day every once in a while. You walk by and you'd let something in on accident, and God knows the innocent of your heart, and you get it out. When you first find out that it's there, you get it out. That's the attitude of a Christian. Okay. But I've made mistakes, and I look back at my past. Anytime Satan got in to start messing up my life, and start trying to sift me like wheat was when I let him. When I opened the door, I let sin back into my life. I let the flesh take over. Okay. Now, the other thing I put on here is notice it says Jews received part of this ministry. You cannot betray someone unless you were part of them. Judas Iscariot, if he was just some stranger, and who cares? that it's not really called betrayal. He actually was part of them and betrayed Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So be careful. That's like it's a whole other study, but I wanted to make a big point about it. You know, Be careful. Don't let Satan sift you like wheat. But right now you've got Peter back to the study. Peter, he's getting up and he's saying, hey, I'm going to strengthen, he has the attitude, I'm going to strengthen the brethren. But has he been converted yet? No. Acts 121. Here he goes. Wherefore of these men which have company with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Now granted, yes, there's supposed to be a twelfth apostle, but who's the one that decides who's an apostle and who's not an apostle? Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, read this sometime on your own time, but you go to John 6, 28, 31. 
Actually, I'm going to have to stop this video and we're going to have to move this inside. It's starting to rain. <laughs> so, I'll see you guys inside. Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, outside, the weather around here, the wind comes in and it can really just carry the clouds really fast. So one minute it seems like it's okay to film outside and the next minute it starts raining. So I wanted to film outside. It was kind of beautiful to me out for a... Uh, for our end of fall day, it was a beautiful day, and I wanted to be outside. Um, so where we left off, we're talking about Paul. Oh, that's not Paul. We're talking about Peter here. Okay, I'll reread it again. Acts 1.21. Wherefore, all these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. We're talking about Jesus going in and out among them. But he acts like these people have been with him the whole time. They've been with the ministry this whole time. These people have been with us. All right. Some of you might know where I'm going to be going. All right. 22. Beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Okay. There was a lot of witnesses to his resurrection. Think about this, brothers and sisters of Christ. There was a lot of people that were witnesses, eyewitnesses to his resurrection. But an apostle is someone that Jesus Christ chooses. And there's going to be 12 apostles. One fell, one needed to be replaced. That's up to Jesus to take care of that. Okay? It's not Peter's place to take care of that. It's up to Jesus to take care of that. Okay? And, and Peter's jumping the gun. And we're going to see that here. Okay? But the point that I'm going to make, we're going to go through some of the scriptures, is that he talks about how all these people, all these 120,000 people, these, we're going to pick some, uh, from some of them that have been with us from the very beginning, and they've been with us the whole time. And he's, he's kind of insinuating that's what I'm getting, because he's trying to be a speaker and, and put on a good speech. And I'm not putting Peter down. I'm just saying, he doesn't have the Holy Spirit. He's not supposed to be strengthening the brethren until he is converted. He hasn't been converted yet. Okay. When someone gets saved today, do we have to wait to be converted? No. Acts is a transition book. There was things going on transitioning from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The death of Jesus Christ is when the New Testament started, but there had to be a transition period to get people over to the New Testament. Right. So let's look at some of this. These people that he's talking about here says, What for of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us? So it was Jesus that came in and out, but these people, it's almost, I mean, I get from there that they've been with you the whole time. They never deserted Jesus. They never left. Nothing. But what does the Bible say? Okay, now remember, people say, well, isn't this a contradiction? No. This is Peter speaking. And he's not speaking by the Holy Ghost. This is just a record that this is what Peter said. Doesn't mean it has to be true. It's just a record of what Peter said. He didn't have the Holy Ghost in him. Okay? He wasn't um, confirmed by the Holy Spirit. So turn with me to John 6, 28. John 6, 28. We're going to talk, read about disciples. Jesus is preaching about the body. You know, the flesh, my flesh, eat my flesh, drink my blood. And he's, t he's speaking spiritually, but they can't handle it. So we're going to hit 28. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What doest thou? What dost thou work? Our father did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Moses gave it to us. If you actually go back and read it, God, it came from heaven. God gave it to him. Okay. He just spoke through Moses. Moses, you know. 33. The bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Now he's talking about himself. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. 
He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. He's speaking spiritually. Okay? Death, burial, and resurrection. Salvation. The Holy Spirit coming in. Opening up this book, telling us how to live. But he's talking about his death and resurrection. The death is what brings in the New Testament. Never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Him that cometh to me. And I, just a little side note, I always got to say this. Make, sh make sure, brother and sister Christ, um, there's a lot of false converts out there in the world. We talked about this already. Uh, false Jesus is in the world. They have to come to the real Jesus Christ of Scripture, and he'll in no wise cast you out. He didn't cast me out. He didn't cast some of the brothers and sisters in Christ that are watching this out. But there's a lot of people out there that they want what they want. They want to live how they want, and they want to make, Je they make Jesus conform to them. Instead of them conforming to the way Jesus is, and how he wants us to be, and who he is, God, fully and completely, they conform, they get him to conform, and Jesus doesn't conform to them, but they make up this Jesus that conforms to them and gives them what they want. Okay? But the real Jesus Christ, when you come to him, broken and true biblical repentance, godly sorrow for your personal sins that you've sinned against him, you're going to have that attitude, Lord, my way doesn't work. Look at my life. Look at the wretched man that I am. My way doesn't work. The world's way doesn't work. You come to him broken and saying, Lord, save me. I want your way. Show me your way. He'll no wise cast you out. Okay? The deception today is there's a lot of false Jesuses out there, false religions, false Christianity, false converts, as the Bible says, as Paul says, false converts out there deceiving people. They never came to Jesus Christ, the real Jesus Christ. They never came to Him broken. Remember that. Okay? We, brothers and sisters of Christ, we came broken, saying, my way doesn't work. The world's way doesn't work. I need your way, Lord. I need you. Command me. Command me, O Lord. Verse 38. For I come down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose, lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is he and raise it up again at the last day. I'm going to die someday, brother, says Christ, or I might be blessed with seeing the catching away of the body of Christ, but there's been a lot of Christians in the past that have passed away, but they're going to be raised at the, at the catching away of the body of Christ. Jesus is going to lose nothing. Okay? And this is the one will of Him that sent me, and everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on Him may have everlasting life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. I am the bread. They couldn't handle that. These are disciples, people walking among him. And some that are probably just listening. But we're going to get on there. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered, remember, we already talked about this, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was born of a virgin, coming in the likeness of sinful flesh so he could take on the sins of the world. It's still God manifest in the flesh. That's who Jesus is. He's God the Father manifest in the flesh. Verse 43, Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. He knows their hearts. He can hear what they're saying. And like I said, be careful what you do in your life, brother and sister Christ, and what you say, and don't think for one second that you're getting away with anything. Saying something you shouldn't say, doing something you shouldn't do, or not doing something that you're supposed to be doing. 
God's watching you. God knows. Verse 44, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me. Draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath, ear, hath heard, hath learned of the Father, cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he. I just want to make sure we didn't go too far. No, it's a long one. So I want to go through the whole thing that he's talking about. He's basically saying, I am God. I am salvation. You want everlasting life? You go through me. And I'm going to have to die and bleed to save the world. It's for God so loved, past tense, to save the world. Thy man who hath seen the Father hath seen which of God he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the bread, I say, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. They didn't understand the crucifixion. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. He's not talking about physically doing it. He's talking spiritually. He's talking after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Future. Verse 2. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now remember we talked about being patient. If these people, we're going to get and realize these people deserted him. If you were patient, after the death, burial, and resurrection, the Holy Spirit comes in, opens what happened, and explains it. Oh, now I get it. These people weren't patient. They wanted answers, and they wanted it now. They wanted the kingdom to come right now. They wanted this, they wanted that. I want, I want, now, 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 now. Like a little two-year-old. Like a child. That gets hungry. I want food now. I want this. I, I see someone playing with that toy and they're happy. I want that toy now. It's like that kind of attitude that they were having. They weren't patient. For my flesh is meat indeed. And my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eateth this bread shall live for ever. These things saith he in the synagogues, as he taught the Capernaum. Many, and this is the main point, I read the whole thing to understand that before I was saved, I didn't understand any of that. After I was saved, I still didn't understand some of that. God slowly starts showing me things. Right? There's brothers since Christ have done great teachings on that. It's not literally you need to eat. They kept thinking the sign. They keep thinking physical. He wants us to eat and drink his blood. The, the commandment is you're not allowed to drink blood. It's a sin. Right? They, I don't get it. So what was their ad response to that? Did they, were they patient? Did they wait? No. Verse 60, Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying, who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? And they did. Book of Acts, we're reading it. Chapter 1. What if you see it? Some of them saw it. I have no doubt some of these, the whole point is, is I believe these disciples, not ever, all these um, disciples stayed with them. They left them. Everybody left Jesus Christ. Everybody turned their back on Jesus Christ. Okay? At one point. But some of them probably came back. Absolutely. But Paul's, or Peter's making out like they were with them from day one, and they never deserted, and it's only Jesus that came in and out and came in and out. We're going to read here, okay? What if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? 
read that, but I had to read it again because like, yeah, you just think about it. They got to see it. And what a sight to see. When we get caught up, what a sight to see. It's going to be a sight. When we come back at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble with Jesus Christ, it's going to be a sight to see. 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The bread that he's talking about, remember Jesus is the capital W word. He's the manifest word. When he's there speaking, it's God speaking because he is God. Then you have the written word. Mm -hmm. Verse 64, But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. God knew. So when we read this, it's like, well, maybe Judas Iscariot wasn't saved at all. But remember, back then, you know, he got part of the, um, of the ministry. Like I said, I believe Judas was probably started off with you know, I still believe with Judas Iscariot, he might have been a little bit skeptical or something, but at some point with Judas Iscariot, Satan really got his hands on him and sifted him like wheat. We talked about that. Okay? Really got his hands on him. Why? Because his temptations, the lust of the flesh, his sins, he got the better of him, and he chose that over Jesus Christ. And he, he, desert, he desired uh, Peter. Satan desired Peter. He wanted Peter to betray Jesus Christ. For Jesus knew if the beginning of who believe on beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Now here's the key right here. I know we read a lot for just this one thing, but I wanted to read the context. There's arguments against these Jews. I don't get it. I don't get it. Then it goes over to his disciples, the ones that supposedly stuck with him the whole time. That's what Peter kind of makes it out in that speech, like they stuck with him the whole time. And it says here in verse 16, And from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They walked no more with him. Verse 67, Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? There's only twelve left. Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter might not get it. We might not get it, but thou art the Christ. He, you know, Peter's being patient or he's just, you know, being faithfully stubborn, if you want to say it like that. A good stubborn Christian, a good stubborn Christian today. He's being faithful. He's like, but I don't. I might not get what he's saying. But thou art the Christ, the Son of the Living God. Thou hast the words of eternal life. Verse seven. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. They're talking about he is a devil. But this is into the ministry, his Jesus's earthly ministry. Okay. So you see there that the disciples have forsaken him. What about the apostles? One of you twelve. You see they stay with him. They don't get what he's saying, but they stay with him. What about the apostles? Is there any Jesus? Mark chapter 14. Mark 14, 43. And immediately, while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And he that betrayed him had given him a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Take him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he was come, he goeth straightway to him, and saith, Master, Master, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on him, and took him. And one of them that stood by drew a sword. We talked about this. I got my sword back here. We talked about this. It's Peter. Okay, we found out who the person was that drew the sword. Drew a sword, and smote a servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are you come out 
as against a thief with swords and with staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple, teaching, and ye took me not. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. And they all forsook him and fled. So people could try to argue where well, there might have been some disciples along with, because he could have gotten more disciples from that period on, and he could have. And there were probably disciples with him with the apostles. Okay, it doesn't matter. It said all forsook him and fled. And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast about his n naked body, and the young men laid hold on him. And he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. They were scared. So when it came to the words of God that they didn't understand, you still had some people stay with Jesus Christ, the twelve. But when it came to physical violence, you know, their lives being threatened, they all fled. They all deserted Jesus Christ. But Peter said there, that these men have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John. We're back in Acts chapter 1, verse 21. And beginning of John, until the same day that he was taken up from us. Okay. We just read there. Now, if you want to read the story, uh, Peter denies Jesus three times. You keep going along. If you keep following, Jesus falls, uh, Peter falls from a distance. And then when they call him out, hey, you're with Jesus Christ. He ended up denying Jesus Christ three times. But here's Peter making a grand speech. No Holy Spirit whatsoever. He's making a grand speech. And some of it is truth, but some of it's, it do, it's, doesn't seem right. Mm -hmm. Acts 15, verse 35. Okay, go ahead and turn to Acts 15, 35 before we finish up Acts. Okay. The whole point of study is the commandments of God and being patient and waiting. The commandments of God, patiently waiting. What happens when you fail to start obeying the commandments of God? What happens when you start letting sin in your life and start doing things the world's way? You let Satan in. You start messing up like Peter's messing up here. Okay. What Peter's going to do is Peter's going to try to say this is going to be the next apostle. Mm -hmm. uh, and God didn't choose that person. And today we have teachers that, preachers that teach that say, well, he was numbered with them, but, but you know, and they get so confused. About, he's not an apostle. This guy that we're going to get to, that Peter decides to, we're going to number him among the, the twelve, it wasn't Holy Spirit inspired, and it was not of God. Okay. There was a transition period. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. Paul, or Peter, was commanded, commanded, along with all the others, that they are to wait until the promise of the Holy Father, the Holy Spirit, Pentecost, that they are re redeemed, converted, I'm sorry, converted, the word's converted. They were supposed to wait until they were converted. Peter was told by Jesus Christ to wait until he was converted before he strengthened the brethren. And he didn't. He jumped the gun. But Acts 15.35, you read about Paul. Now remember, they just said all these people were with us to the beginning of the day. Now, did Paul have a hard time with men that didn't do the work? They wanted to reap the harvest, but they didn't want to do the work? Just thought I wouldn't throw this in there real quick. Acts uh, chapter 15, verse 35. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. See the fruits. Okay, And you know by some of the letters that some of them got messed up, some of them this, that, all these different stages of a Christian, the walk of a Christian, uh, when you go through all the different uh, Pauline epistles. But Paul's uh, saying, hey, I want to go see how they're doing. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought it not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia. In other words, he, just, he gave up and left. Whether he couldn't understand, or physical pressures, threatenings, the hardships, whatever it was, he bailed. I give up. I'm, I'm out of here. Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. 
and the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other, and so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Sicilia, confirming the churches. Notice says Paul was chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren and unto the grace of God. And we hear more about Paul, and we don't really hear much about Barnabas, who took Mark anymore. Kind of drops out of the picture. Mark might have been a bad influence. Maybe he's saying, that Mark guy, he starts stuff, he doesn't finish it. Uh, he's going to rub off on you. He's, he's going to really pull you down. Paul saw something that wasn't right. Okay. You have all these men that Peter, going back to Peter, that says, hey, they were with us from the very beginning, and you read about how everybody, eventually everybody, deserted Jesus Christ. When the going got tough, the tough fled. And one of them fled naked. Mm -hmm. But the point I made at the beginning of this study was that you can kind of apply this to all these organized religions and everything. Paul's given this great speech. It sounds good. I mean, you read it, it sounds good. But is it of God? And these Babel buildings and our government here in America, they have this, this, this whole deception of we are choo we'll choose who we want and then we'll put them before you and say you can choose. And it's not choice. It's deception. Okay? Uh, presidency. You can only vote for this person or that person, which they never really say it, but they really push it. We've got this Democrat, we've got this Republican, and you're to vote for one of these two when you can vote for any American that qualifies to be president. And same thing with uh, uh, all the way down to a councilman in a city, just a city area, or a county area, okay? They qualify, you can vote for anybody. You don't have to vote for the people that they say you have to vote for, but they always been pushing this and everybody's brainwashed with this saying, well, I've got to vote for whoever they tell me to vote for. Right. I see what's going on here in chapter one of Acts, the way Peter's doing things, it's almost like he's going back to like the Pharisees and the way they were trying to do things and the old ways. And it's like, that's not God's way anymore. If it was, like I said, casting lots, that's a whole other story and I'm getting ahead of myself. But brothers and sisters in Christ, when God wants to choose something, you let God choose. And He can choose anyone. There's 120 people to choose from. None of them was, and you find out later, none of them were the ones that God wanted. Turn to Acts, back to Acts, we're going to get through the last part of Acts. Chapter 1, verse 23. But you saw there, even with uh, Paul, when you have someone that just in and out, in and out, yeah, I want to help, I'm going to quit. Uh, I mean, it wasn't just like he said, I'm busy, I can't go with you guys. Evidently he went and halfway through quit. Okay. And you see that a lot. You see that a lot. Okay. People that, you know, play in politics. We call what we call politics. Acts one twenty three. And they appointed two. They appointed two. Did Jesus appoint two? No. They appointed two. Joseph called Bar Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. Math Matthias, if you want to say it, Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knoweth the hearts of all men. Stop there. Thou, Lord, that knowest. Remember, Jesus was, uh, Peter was there when Jesus was calling out the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. Jesus knows the hearts of men. He knew what they said. Without them, they like, he heard us. Or he probably wasn't there and walked in and said, Why would you guys say this about me? Or that, you know, He knew what they said. He knows the hearts of men. Thou knowest the hearts of men. Okay. Matthew, you don't have to turn here, but Matthew chapter 9 and 4 says, And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? He knew their hearts. Matthew 15, 18 reads, But those things which proceed out of the mouth cometh forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adulterers, fornication, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defile not a man. Jesus knows the heart of man. That's the heart of man, for the most part. When I was lost, 
uh, I was doing all kinds of watching entertainment, movies, Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, secular style music, uh, you know, jokes, this, whatever, and it was, that was coming from my heart. Remember, they don't have the Holy Spirit yet. Okay? When Jesus saved me and the Holy Spirit came in, it was God who cleaned up my life. I didn't clean up my life. I couldn't clean up my life. It took Jesus Christ coming in and showing me His Word and saying, commanding me, do this, don't do that. You're supposed to be doing this. Start every day with the Word of God. End the day with the Word of God. Okay, you're supposed to be praying without ceasing. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Uh, you're not supposed to be drunken. And so on and so forth. God cleaned up my life. My heart was wicked. God's the one that cleaned up my heart. Okay? Yes, the Lord knows the hearts of men, of all men. Yeah, He does. That's a statement. But it sounds good when you're trying to add it to what Peter's trying to do here. He's trying to strengthen the brethren before he's converted. Show whether of these two thou hast chosen. Now stop there. I've talked about this before, but I really want to bring it up again. And they appointed to, and then they say, thou hast chosen. Show us what thou hast chosen. We see that a lot. Okay, it's that big deception, Satan's ultimate deception, where he's trying to tell you, this is what I want. I want this, and I want this. You can choose between the two, and it's the deception of choice. We have that here in America. You see that in organized religion. When you have the people at the top that are uh, ho uh, ruling over the laity, they give them the deception that you have a choice. They feed their flesh to get their flesh all riled up, and then they feed them deceptions that they have choice when they don't have choice. They're not choosing. Mm -hmm. Verse 25, that he may take part of the ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his place. Now, who did Jesus choose? Mm -hmm. Acts 8.3 says, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. Think about this. You had 120 men there. Um, disciples. Oh, they had supposedly been there from the very beginning. You know, that great speech that Peter gave and everything. And they made the comment that, Thou, Lord, which knoweth the hearts of all men. That cannot be more true with Paul. Or first it's Saul, later becomes Paul. God knows the hearts of man. Okay? He saw something in Saul. Later on, Paul talks about how the things he did before he was saved, when it comes to hunting down the church and everything, he thought he was doing God's work. But he did it ignorantly. But when he came to the truth, on the way to Damascus, on the road to Damascus, okay, when he came to the truth, the way, the truth, and the life, he grabbed onto it. God knew his heart. Who did God choose to be an apostle? Paul. Saul later became Paul. Jesus saw right through him. Don't think that this our government here in America and any other government is deceiving God. Don't think these organized religions out there are deceiving God in any way, shape, or form. God saw right through what was going on here and, said, and he's like, no, I didn't choose any one of those people. Okay, That's not who I want. I've got a man in mind. He knew Paul, about Saul. He had him in mind and said, that's the man. Mm -hmm. Acts 9, 1 says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. And you keep down, going down, Acts 9, and it talks about the road to Damascus, where he sees Jesus Christ. Like I said, the Acts is the transition book. And God says, okay, you're going to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Preach, uh, the, the gospel gets preached to the world, as Jesus said it would. Okay, not just to the Jews here at Jerusalem, but to the world the gospel will be preached. Paul was commissioned as an apostle to the Gentiles by Jesus Christ. And the way we know that is because he had the signs of an apostle. 
You read over in Revelation where it says there's people that say they're apostles and have been tried and found liars. I'm paraphrasing, but they've been tried and found liars. Paul healed people. Then that the um, like I said, the transition book, they're still trying to preach repentance. They're doing baptism, water baptism still in the book of Acts. But after the book of Acts, there's no water baptism. Why? Because they're preaching the kingdom of heaven. They're still trying to preach and give the Jews another chance to accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah, the Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, to bring in the millennial kingdom. And when they flat out deny Jesus Christ as a whole, not all Jews, but as a whole, the sign gifts went away. But before the sign gifts went away, did Paul have them? Yeah. A snake bit him. That's so poisonous, it's, it's like a three-step snake, if you want to say that. You know, you take three steps and you die. People were sitting there looking at him, waiting for him to die. He, a snake bit him, and he just grabbed the snake and threw him in the fire. I can't remember if he threw him in the fire just threw him away, but he didn't die. He healed people. He had signs, the, the sign gifts of an apostle, not a disciple, an apostle. Where was the sign gifts for this? Uh, uh, they, we haven't got to that part, but the one of the guys that got chosen was Matthias. Where was the sign gifts? Where was the testing? Peter healed people. Okay. So you got to be careful. When you walk away, let's finish this up real quick. Acts, uh, the last chapter, uh, verse in Acts, Acts one twenty six, and they gave forth their lots, and the lots fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. And people say, well, see, we got to number them with the apostles and everything. It says he was numbered. Who did the numbering? The men there that didn't have the Holy Spirit in them. That's the one that did the number. Did God do the numbering? No. Brother Jesus Christ, this is a great example. Like I said, it's a transition book. They didn't have the Holy Spirit in them. Okay? They weren't obeying God's command to wait. They jumped the, uh, Peter jumped the gun. Okay? So when you walk away from this study, Brother Jesus Christ, just remember, commandments of God. The life of a Christian is the commandments of God. We love God. We've given Him our lives, and when you give God your life, that means He's in charge. He gives the commands, we obey. And when we fail to obey, we make a mistake. When we decide to do things our way, like Peter did, you make a mistake. That wasn't the twelfth apostle. Paul was the twelfth apostle, right? And was proven to be an apostle by the sign gifts, right? The commands in your life as a Christian. When you start turning your back on this book, this is where you get the commands of God as a Christian. The first command is what? What's the first command in a Christian's? Uh, the first command in a man's life or a woman's life. Repent and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's the first command. Commands start at salvation. You have to come to Him broken saying, You're in charge. Lord, I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner. On my way to hell, and I deserve to go to hell for sinning against you. An almighty, righteous God, creator of all things. You come to Him with that attitude of brokenness that I'm at, the, at your feet. I'm at your mercy, Lord. I'm yours. Tell me what to do. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Confess both in prayer. Ask God to save you. That's where the command first starts. And from then on, God says, Okay, now that you're mine, the Bible talks about being bought. You're bought with a price. You're not your own. Uh, feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. You're bought. At that point, God commands you by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. Starts telling you what to do and starts cleaning up your life. That's the life of a Christian. Okay? And it takes the Holy Spirit. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. And they start making a mess. You have a lot of false converts out there that don't have the Holy Spirit. And they come in and what do they do? They start making a huge mess. Every time. Now, I'm not saying Peter was a false convert or those 120, but they were to wait. It's a transition book. They were to wait 
until they got the Holy Spirit. But your commands, when you get saved, you got commands. Jesus is your king. A king commands. A king judges. Read the Old Testament. A king commands and a king judges. Right? Before that, they had judges. Before they had kings. Right? But you truly get saved. Jesus comes into your life. He commands you obey. No ifs, ands, or buts. No excuses. No twisting scripture. No picking and choosing what you want to believe or as far as what you want to follow and what you don't want to follow. Be careful, brothers and sisters of Christ. I can be... I can look back when I was newly saved that there was things I tried to hold on to. I tried to find exceptions. I tried to find loopholes. You see some people still doing that, trying to find loopholes to justify sin in their life and everything. Um, commands. That's part of the life of a Christian. God commands, we obey. And the second big part of a Christian is being patient and waiting. Waiting on whatever Jesus wants us waiting on. For them, he wanted them to wait for Pentecost before they did anything. For us today as Christians, we get saved. He wants us to wait patiently a lot of times. You get so headstrong saying, I want to do this for the Lord, and I want to do that for the Lord. And Peter's like, I'm going to jump up. I've got to do something for Jesus Christ. I'm going to jump up, and we're going to, how about a 12th apostle? Let's get a 12th apostle going. Uh, weren't we told to wait by Jesus? We're supposed to wait until the Holy Spirit comes. That promise. No, 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 we can get this done real quick. It's okay, we can do this and get, get this done real quick. You see? In your life as a Christian, you do a lot of reading, you do a lot of studying, you do a lot of sanctification. But when it comes to the work of God, there's going to be hardcore work and you're going to be doing work, but there's times where God's going to be like, you need to wait. And those are hard times. Because we're just so excited, we want to jump up and we want to do something for the Lord, but the Lord says, wait. Just, just wait. Oh, but Lord, what a... I said, wait. Trust me. Wait. And those times that we wait, things, things all seem to come together. Okay, that's why you wanted me to wait. That, I wanted to go down that road, but you had me wait, and that road collapsed. <laughs> you know, like a bridge. But we're using this in our life about different things. Use a bridge. That bridge, I want to go across that bridge. I want to go across that bridge, because that's the direction I want to go. I think that's what the Lord wants in there. Uh, and the Lord's like, no, I want you to wait. Just wait. And the bridge collapse. And you just stand there with wide eyed and go, and I wanted to walk across that bridge. Lord, thank you for telling me to wait. And the Lord's like, okay, now go that way. Go across that bridge. Okay? And I know I'm just using this as a, as a physical, but you know what I'm saying, brother, says Christ? You wait because God knows what's going to happen. God has a plan. Right? We need to learn to be patient as Christians, and that's what it is. And ultimately, we're waiting to be redeemed. We're getting so sick and tired of this, like, fully redeemed. We're so sick and tired of this lost world. We're so sick and tired of, of false converts. We're so sick and tired of our own flesh to, uh, failing the Lord. Um, we're, we're just getting tired. And we're like, Lord, and we start doubting God. Not doubting God, but questioning God. I mean, how, how many people have said, Lord, and slipped up. I'm, I'm going to raise my hand. How many of us have slipped up in, in our conversations, our private conversations with the Lord, and said, why haven't you come yet? How many, like we're questioning God. Why haven't you come yet? You should have come by now, you know, type attitude. Not that I said you should have come by now, but, you know, we kind of have that attitude. Why haven't you come yet? Uh, we need to be patient, and we need to wait. God's got everything planned out perfectly. In His time. God knows what's going to happen. So brothers and sisters in Christ, when you have people say, well, there's 13 apostles, or there could be more than 12 apostles, there can't be more than 12 apostles. And God's the one that chose the 12 apostles. Okay? And they jumped the gun. When you jump the gun, you make a mess. When you don't obey God's commands, you make a mess. Okay. Then most men that start start steering off and start they could be preaching truth, but they start steering off and failing in certain areas when they're in their preaching. It's probably because something's come into their life that they're trying to justify, and they're not obeying the commands of God. Okay. So, brothers, sisters in Christ, whether you're newly saved, a babe in Christ, or you've been, you know, 
saved for 30 or 40 years. Don't ease up. Okay? Stay hardcore for God's commands. For the King James Bible, God's perfect written word, for the commands that are in. Stay zealous, like Peter was. Stay zealous for God's commands and to please God by obeying His commands. Okay? And be patient, brothers and sisters of Christ. When I look at what's going on in the world today, and don't get scared, don't get so riled up. Um, be patient. Stand for God's word. Stand for what's right. Don't back down. Don't compromise. But we need to be patient to see what God has in store, what's going to happen next. We're still here. Eventually, there is going to be a catch in the way of the body of Christ, but we're still here. And I've rambled enough. But commands of God, and be patient. That's the life of a Christian. And the number, and these two things are the number one thing the world hates as a whole. All these false converts that attack King James Bible-believing ministries, they hate it. We talked about it a little bit earlier before we had to come inside. They hate it. They hate a, being part of something where somebody else is in charge over you and he tells you what to do whether you like it or not. They hate it. They hate being patient. The flesh is not patient. The flesh wants what it wants and it wants it right now. And they're flesh driven. They don't know how to be patient. I'm only able to be patient by the Holy Ghost. God helps me to be patient. He teaches me to be patient. Sometimes hard lessons, sometimes easy lessons. He'll teach us to be patient. Okay, he had to teach Peter to be patient. Okay. So, I want to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want to thank you for watching. And I'll try my best to get back to doing some studies and get back to some of the um, series of studies.